Well, hello, friends. Bring you greetings on this beautiful day and praise God for the gift of this day and for our time to be together in the Word. All right, we are in the Gospel of John. We're picking up uh, John chapter 1 at verse 15. So if you got your Bible, I want to invite you to open there and join me. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, and the place of grace already given. For the, law of, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who, himself, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship to the Father, has made him known. All right, so we're going to do a little bit more than that today, but I wanted to start off with that opening section. And I want to look back at verse 15. This is done differently in, in various translations. Uh, in mine, uh, I am using the new 2011 NIV. And in this translation, uh, verse 15 is, is bracketed with parentheses, so as to set itself apart. Some, uh, some Bibles will use the quotation marks in order to set it apart. And the reason this is being done is that this is referring to John the Baptist. It says, John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. So it's just affirming the statements of John the Baptist, saying, there, you know, John was sent as the prophet to prepare the way for the, for the Messiah. And in the course of his ministry, he said, The one coming after me was actually before me. I was born into this world to, to announce, to, to, you know, to prepare the people but the one who is coming, the one who is the Messiah, he will be coming, and yet he was before I ever was. And certainly we, we capture that when we look at the first 14 verses, talking about the fact that the Son has been since the beginning, since, you know, before the foundations of the heavens and the earth. And then we move into verse 16 here, and this is when the, the gospel writer is now talking again. It says, out of his fullness and grace, or out of his fullness, we have received grace in the place of grace already given. Um, this is also written differently in different translations. Uh, we'll see in some translations it'll say, because of his grace, we've received blessing upon blessing. Uh, and so what, what we talk about is we talk about God's favor, God's un, unmerited, unwarranted favor that, that is shown toward us, even though we are rebellious and sinful and there is this incredible devotion, this commitment, this love, this uh, this desire to be in relationship with us. And it's not because of anything that we have done, that we have earned, but rather it is God's character and God's nature. And so John just lifts this up in just this incredible grace. And then he's going to get a little deeper in verse 17 as he says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law actually exposed sin, but it also gave kind of a, uh, a covenant by which we could live. God said, live by, by this law. I mean, this is the Ten Commandments, and this is the whole Deuteron Deuteronomic and Levitical laws that we find in the first five books of the Bible. And it, it gave us a way to uh, live according to God's kingdom purposes, to live, um, to live in a way that honored God. And so that was given, and that was given to Moses. We're specifically talking the, uh, the Ten Commandments are, are really the centerpiece of that. And, but, but at the same time, that's the very thing that revealed just how sinful we are, that it showed our rebellion. It showed where we lie and murder and steal and dishonor the Sabbath and have false idols and false gods and uh, just all of the different images that we see in the Ten Commandments. Um, but it says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So through Jesus, now John's looking at this almost from an, an, an end perspective, almost looking back over the whole gospel. So this is kind of almost still an introduction. Uh, and, and he's saying grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He came to bring something that the law couldn't. The law couldn't save us. But the grace of Christ could as he poured out his blood on the cross in place of ours and redeemed us and, and brought us into full relationship with the Father. 
it goes on in verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who himself is God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. There are a lot of folks out there that when they, they read this, or when they do a commentary on this, they say, well, th this is completely separate. This, this, is, this looks like a tag. This looks like something that was added on afterwards. But I would contend to you, uh, I've read, also read a lot of commentaries on, on the opposite side, saying this is that culminating verse. This is what brings it all together. This is the one that says the Son that we've been talking about all the way back to the very first verse of this gospel, the Son who is himself God, is in closest relationship with the Father. So the closest that, that, that we can get to the Father is to be in relationship with the Son. And it says, He has come. He is here. He has entered in to pour out grace and truth to us. And we receive this grace and truth. So John is, is really setting the stage for reading the rest of this gospel about Jesus Christ. He's saying he, he's the key. He is how we draw closer to the Father than we've ever drawn before. This is how we are immersed in the presence of God. And as we learn more and more and more about who Jesus is and what Jesus brings to us, we, we capture a greater understanding of this great grace that it, it's more than just the cross. The, the cross is certainly the centerpiece but it's more than just the cross. God came down to earth. God came in the flesh, in the person of the Son, in the person of Jesus Christ, to redeem us and to form a relationship with us where, as he said it in his own words, that I do no longer call you servants, but friends. The sovereign over all creation said, I call you friends, you are mine. Let's move on into verse 19, because we get a little more unpacking of John the Baptist here. Now, this was John's testimony. This is John the Baptist. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess, confess freely. I am not the Messiah. First prophet in almost 400 years. You can imagine why they're thinking, Oh, that this might be the Messiah, and he's powerful in word and deed, and you know, it it seems like John may have that title, but he says, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? Have you been raised Elijah, the great prophet of old? He said, I am not. He said, Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. And finally they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah nor Elijah the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. This was a baptism of repentance. It was a call for people to turn from and acknowledge their wicked ways, turn away from their that is what the, the core definition, I baptize with water, I do a baptism of repentance, so people acknowledge their sin and turn from their wicked ways. It says, but among you stands one that you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. He is the one whose straps of his own sandals I am un, not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. So why does he make this comment about the sandals? It, it, it seems almost out of place where it's like, well, who are you? You know, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. I'm not, I'm the one who is, I'm going to go back to his words. He says, I am the one, I am the voice calling in the wilderness. In other words, I am the voice calling uh, amidst those who are lost and confused and, and overwhelmed by sin. I am the voice calling out to everybody, make straight the way for the Lord, prepare, make preparation, repent, turn from your wickedness and prepare for his coming, for he is coming. He is coming after me. I'm not him. I'm not one. And, and so when you have the first prophet in almost 400 years, there were many that were looking at John and, and you know, they had their suspicions. They thought with, with what he was able to do with his, his just powerful words, with his 
called to repentance that perhaps indeed he was the Messiah, but he dissuaded them from this. He, he made it clear that's not what his role was. His role was to prepare the way. And when he talks about the, you know, who he is versus who the, who the Messiah is, first prophet in almost 400 years, you can imagine how people looked at John, how they uh, admired him, almost revered him in many ways, and how they might want to exalt him onto a high pedestal and, and really put him in a place and a position of respect. But John made it clear. He said, when the, when the Messiah comes, when the one who is the, the Savior comes, he goes, my role? I may be a great prophet. I may have called many to repentance. I may baptize with water. But my role or my place compared to who he is, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He is so far and above and beyond me. No matter how great a prophet I may be, he is so far above and beyond that I'm not even worthy to lean down and untie the sandals off his feet. Friends, that's a powerful image and a powerful witness of humility and a powerful preparation of the people. Sometimes we need to step back and look at when, when somebody that we so deeply admire, that we, like they admired John the Baptist, they looked at him and, and people traveled around and they responded to his preaching and his teaching. And when one who is in that position, who could claim the glory for themselves, when one in that position says, I want to tell you there's one coming after me, and it's in him where you'll really find life. He is the true one. I am nothing. He is where it's all at. So friends, it's an invitation for us. It's an invitation for us to draw close to the Son, to know that in Christ and Christ alone is life. Praise be to God. All right, friends, let us go forth this day in the great and mighty grace of our God in our glorious relationship with Jesus Christ. Let us go forth and know always God loves you.